Hello, welcome to News Now on TV360. I am Fidelia Agoncha. We'll begin with details of the deadly accident along the Lagos Ibadan Expressway. Four persons, including a five year old boy, have been confirmed dead in the accident, which involved a motorcycle and a trailer on Kara Bridge, the Lagos Ibadan Expressway. Spokesperson of the Ogun State Traffic Compliance and Enforcement Corps, Babatunde Akimbi, also confirmed the mother of the five year old boy who sustained injuries has been rescued and taken to the hospital. The woman and her late son were said to be passengers on a commercial motorcycle before the container on the trailer fell on them. The three occupants of the truck who fell into the river were also confirmed dead. President Muhammad Buhari has written to the Nigerian Senate explaining what his administration is doing to solve the farmer headers crisis in the country. A new report by Amnesty International on Tuesday had claimed that more than 150 persons have been killed by herdsmen in 2018 alone. The killings have irked the Senate who are investigating the matter. In President Buhari's letter to the lawmakers, he assured that security agencies are investigating the issue, insisting he is confident arrests will be made soon. Meanwhile, in response to the President's letter, the Nigerian Senate has summoned the Inspector General of Police, Ibrahim Idris, to appear before it. Idris is currently in Benue, the most affected state, to find a lasting solution to the headsman crisis. The Senate had given the IG two weeks to discover the solution, but are now insisting he has not met their demands with the deadline expired. Idris is expected to appear before the Senate Committee on Police before next Tuesday. Still on the farmers' headers crisis, the Nigerian military says it has discovered a base used by armed militias terrorizing Benue, Nasarawa and Taraba state at Todunga town in Katina Ala local government area of Benue state. The army also says it has arrested a native doctor who allegedly supplied charms to the militias. The military in a release signed by the director, Army Public Relations, Brigadier General Sane Usman said the native doctor was arrested along with one of his accomplices, Atto Francis. Usman, however, noted that Francis was shot dead by troops during the operation. In a huge boost to Nigeria's anti-terrorism campaign, the army says it has started road construction into the main heartland of Sambisa Forest and its bordering towns. The military in a statement said work has commenced along Goza Yemteka Biza Road as well as the reconstruction of the road from Goza Yemteka Bita to Kemba in Sambiza Forest. The statement also adds that the road construction is a follow-up to its ongoing clearance operation in the northeast. Nigeria has been battling Boko Haram for about nine years now. In 2016, the army dislodged the group from its major stronghold in Sambisa. But top commanders of the group, including Abu Bakr Shekau, have continued to evade the military. The Nigerian police has warned members of the public against walking or driving alone in areas that has been labelled dark spot for men of the underworld. Spokesperson Police Postperson Jimo Moshud gave the advice in Abuja when parading five suspected kidnappers at the force headquarters who allegedly operate on the Abuja Kaduna Highway. Five suspected kidnappers were paraded by the police, among whom was a 70-year-old man. The suspects, according to the first public relations officer, Jim Amoshud, were notorious for operating along the Cardinal Abuja Highway. They were arrested for kidnapping an 11-year-old girl and demanding for ransom. The girl was kidnapped on 19 January but was rescued by the police four days after. Uh, they were arrested in the act of kidnapping a young girl and they demanded for ransom of 500,000 Naira in the village. Uh, the police team attached to the special tactical squad uh, were moved in by the Inspector General of Police to work with the Cardinal State Police Command and other police detachment attached to Operation Amuni and sources was hand. The 70-year-old man house was used as the hostage camp. Also paraded was a suspected fake police inspector who specializes in defrauding members of the public. The suspect, John Tosso, claims he was in charge of auctioning exhibit cars 
of the Nigerian police, thereby defrauding people. He has so far collected 439,000 fraudulently. His offense is obtaining money and property under false pretense, criminal conspiracy, criminal conspiracy cheating, forgery, and impersonation. He was arrested on the 20th of October 2017, sorry. Uh, 20th of October 2017, and since the investigation have commenced into all this atrocity that he has committed. Uh, he's a one-man squad. Uh, the, he always take unsuspecting members of the public, including uh, personnel of other security agencies, uh, to the open car park close to 4 CID in Area 10, and show them people's vehicles, that those vehicles are about to be auctioned by the police and it can facilitate them buying the vehicles. The police said all the suspects will be charged to court while advising members of the public to disregard any information relating to sale of cars. Police also say it is patrolling the Kaduna Abuja Highway 24 hours to ensure safety of road users. From Abuja, Sunjo Lani TV 360. About 25 political parties say they are ready to give the ruling All Progressive Congress a good fight in the 2019 general elections as they form a coalition to achieve this ambition. The new body known as Coalition for a New Nigeria said it will mobilize across the length and breadth of Nigeria to achieve success in 2019 and set the country on the path of true growth. Tunji Olanikbeko now reports. As Nigerians count down to 2019 elections, different political parties and organizations spring up almost on a daily basis. The latest is the Coalition for a New Nigeria, CNN. The body, which is a coalition of more than 25 parties, says its major objective is defending the unity of Nigeria and ensure economic stability. If it, the body said, the ruling or progressive Congress has failed to achieve in the last three years. As the division of the country along ethnic Religious and regional lines have become wider and more acute. In June 2017, a group of patriotic political parties came together to form the coalition for New Nigeria with the major objective of defending the unity of the country while providing solutions on the ways to move the nation in the right direction. The Coalition for a New Nigeria says there are many pressing needs for the country right now, which the ruling party has not lived up to, while stressing the need for local government autonomy to kickstart economic revolution and proper governance from the local level. As we are, we are 30 and we are still counting. And so we will go from there and make decisions that will enhance credible leaders that will emerge from the discussion in the coalition. The CNN. We need to make it clear that Nigeria will not adequately, without an effective local government system, properly elected by the people at the grassroots level, to continue dealing with local council administration as the previous government is not attainable. The proper conduct of relation into the local government council must be observed as provided for in the constitution is seriously recommended. The coalition said it will continue to converse for good and transparent leadership in the country and will advise government adequately on areas that the country lacks policy direction. From Abuja, Tunji Olanikwekun, TV360. The trial of a former Minister of Aviation, Femi Panikayode, for an alleged fraud of 4.9 billion naira was told on Wednesday due to his absence from the Federal High Court in Lagos. His lawyer, Norris M. Quakers, told the court his client was unable to make it to court owing to a heart-related ailment. He asked the court for an adjournment so he could provide a medical report to back up his claims. The request was unopposed by the prosecution. The judge subsequently adjourned the trial to Friday 28 and March 1 and 2, 2018. The federal government has announced special intervention funds for tertiary and specialist hospitals in the country. The Minister of Health, Isaac Adewale, made this known at the opening ceremony of the National Executive Council meeting of National Association of Resident Doctors in Abuja. 
TV360 was there and now reports. The Nigerian government has announced special intervention funds for tertiary and specialist hospitals in the country. Minister of Health Isaac Adewole made this known at the National Executive Council meeting of National Association of Resident Doctors in Abuja, the nation's capital. We're doing what we call general intervention. We are each of the teaching hospital will get 300 million naira to tidy up a few things and make sure that they do better. The FMCs 120 million, the fistula centers 120, and the specialist hospitals 120. Mike Ogrima, the National President of Nigeria Medical Association, NMA, urged the resident doctors and other healthcare professionals to encourage interprofessional relationship, adding that attitude of doctors to themselves, patients and health professionals need to improve. He also expressed regret over the outbreak of Lassa fever in the country in the last few weeks, while expressing sadness for the medical officials who lost their lives while attending to patients. The NMA president advised all medical doctors not to attend to victims of such ailments without protective kits. We must be well Of course, by doc as doctors, we have our ethics. Above all, um, for something Nigerian doctors have advocated for and have been taken by the World Medical Association, we must take care of ourselves before we can take care of others. Earlier, Dr. Chikwe Ihekwazu, Chief Executive Officer, Nigeria Center for Disease Control, said the meeting was critical because it provides avenue for key stakeholders to harmonize ideas on funding the health sector. Nigeria at the moment is that we have 77 confirmed cases, 21 deaths, 10 of those confirmed cases are healthcare workers. This is probably, this is most definitely very sobering news for all of us. With Lhasa, there is simply no magic bullet. There is none. If we're looking for it, we will not find it. So this is a time for all of us to pull together. Doctors, CMDs, Commissioners for Health, and of course the federal government. With the spate of medical tourism outside Nigeria now on the rise and repeated strike actions by health professionals, one would only hope the outcome of this conference will reverse these trends. Only a peaceful society can guarantee freedom of speech and expression. This is why media practitioners should also help maintain a peaceful country by being fair and upright in reporting crisis. This was the submission of the Minister for Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, at a two-day workshop for some selected journalists in Abuja on the topic, conflict-sensitive reporting and safety of journalists. There is no way the issue of conflict reportage could be discussed in Nigeria without a mention of the crisis in the middle but region Benue state. This forms the focus of the speech of the senior special assistant to the president of media, Femi Adeshino, at this forum. The journalist himself, Adeshino, advised media practitioners to uphold the tenets of journalism daily in reporting conflict, warning that biased reporting could later come back to hunt journalists. One thing we need to realize is that those involved in the conflict at the different sides are looking for people to use to advance their positions. And most times, they use journalists. It's the world of fake news now, world of hate speech, world of twisting reports, world of just taking a small part of a report and magnifying it, particularly on the digital media. Therefore, journalists must be careful about what they report. And then we need to note that when law and order breaks down, when law and order breaks down in the society, it does not distinguish the journalist from any other person. Therefore, the journalist himself is at risk. We, we remember what happened in Rwanda and the role the hate speech played and the role that the media played. 
I'm sure when all hell broke loose, they didn't recognize who was a journalist or not. When a bullet comes, it does not distinguish a journalist from a non-journalist. Other speakers at the forum dwell on safety of journalists while reporting conflict and what media practitioners should do to ensure that they are not consumed by the crisis they were reporting. Impunity is widely recognized as one of the greatest threats to press freedom. International press pressure led the United Nations General Assembly to pass a resolution in 2013 recognizing November 2nd as the International Day to end impunity for crimes against journalists. The responsibility of journalists in reporting conflict is such that we continue to learn every day. You have a job to do. The corporate existence of this country is your responsibility. Quite a number of Nigerian journalists have been killed while reporting on conflict and this forum organized by the Federal Ministry of Information in partnership with the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization UNESCO is designed to help journalists safely navigate the dangerous bit of conflict reporting. <laughs> On DG 360, we don't just ask the questions. What is wrong with amending the constitution the way uh, the, the National Assembly members have been doing it? We seek answers. The constitution is constituent. Our problem is not um, lack of laws. Our problem is lack of the willpower to implement our laws. Answers that provide clarity. While we negotiate, we should try to make it a point that the girls must be complete the clarity you need to make informed judgment so that you can make the right decision and take action. People are saying it is you politicians that are responsible for this, that you are the reason oh. why this is happening. All these dollars that call themselves governors in this country? I wish we had people like Tony at the National Assembly. God forbid that I go to join that team. Uh, DG 360, providing clarity to issues. Glad to have you back. The Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment says it will collaborate with the Ministry of Agriculture in an effort to develop the agricultural potentials of Nigeria. The Minister for State, Industry, Trade and Investment, Aisha Abubakar, made this known at a media briefing to explain efforts made by her office to increase the farming of cotton in large scale nationwide. Out of, out of the cotton lint produced in Nigeria, local consumption has dropped to less than 30%, 30,000 metric tons per annum. And the rest are exported to other countries, e.g. the United Kingdom, Thailand, Spain, Malaysia, Japan. This situation calls for serious concern to the ministry as the driver of the industry, and we are now hoping that hosting an event of this magnitude, like the International African Con Cotton Congress, will provide us with the opportunity to revive the ailing subsector. With the current administration's focus on agriculture, Nigeria stands to benefit immensely from the share industry through the employment generation of women and youths, poverty eradication, wealth creation, environment sustainability, and attract foreign exchange earnings. Nigerian lawmakers have called for more investigations into cryptocurrencies to protect Nigerians from the unverified and risky involvement. Beaming its searchlight on the cryptocurrency trend, the lawmakers said it is important for the federal government to pay attention to the rise in cryptocurrency schemes in the country. Bitcoin ads in Nigeria are well circulated as they appear on social media and are even aired on local television and radio stations with the promise of a huge financial windfall. 
the Central Bank of Nigeria warned in 2017 that anyone trading in Bitcoin is doing so at his or her own risk, as cryptocurrencies are not legal tenders in Nigeria. Oil prices fell for a third day on Wednesday ahead of the possible first rise in U.S. inventories in 11 weeks. Brent crude was down 20 cents at $68.82 a barrel, while U.S. crude was down 14 cents at $64.36 a barrel. Despite Wednesday's weakness, prices are still on track for a fifth month of gains and Brent is set for its largest percentage January rise since 2013 with a 2.7% increase. Three Kenyan television stations will remain off-air indefinitely as the government investigates the swearing-in of opposition leader Raila Odinga. This is according to the country's Interior Minister Fred Matangi, who made the announcement on Wednesday. Independently owned Citizens TV and Radio, KTN and NTV, were switched off on Tuesday after they transmitted live coverage of an opposition ceremony to swear in Odinga into office. Matiangi, who is also the minister in charge of security, accused some elements in the media of facilitating the illegal act and putting lives of thousands of Kenyans at risk. The medical charity Medicine on Frontier says the health system in the Central African Republic is almost non-existent as a result of the civil war. It reports that access to health care is extremely difficult due to regular attacks on medical facilities, patients and ambulances. MSF has been attacked on average three times a month, making it one of the world's most dangerous places for humanitarian workers. After more than five years of ethnic and religious-based violence, more than a quarter of the population has been left homeless. On to sports stories now, Nigeria's female national team, Super Falcons, finally has a new coach. The Nigerian Football Federation has unveiled Thomas Denoby as the new head coach of the reigning African champions. He will be assisted by Georgian Peterson and has signed a short-term contract until 2020. Denoby, who spent, who spent nine years with Hammerby IF and played in the European Cup in 1983 and 1985, won 34 caps for Swedish junior team between 1975 and 1981. Arsenal have completed the signing of Pierre Emerick Aboumeyang from Borussia Dortmund for 55 million pounds. For 55 million pounds, Aboumeyang has been subject of negotiations between Gunners and Dortmund for several weeks, with Arsenal initially to meet the Bundesliga side's 70 million pounds asking price. This season, the 28-year-old has scored 21 goals in 24 matches in all competitions. He has found the net 141 times since joining Dortmund and has also scored 23 goals in 56 caps for his home country, Gabon. There was further good news for Arsenal fans as it was announced that star midfielder Mesut Ozil has signed a new three-year contract with the club. The deal, which is an extension of its current deal at the club, sees the German become the club's highest paid player at a reported £350,000 week weekly. His current deal has six months to run. Ozil, who has registered 49 assists since his Premier League debut five years ago, joined Arsenal from Real Madrid in 2013 for a then club record fee of £42.5 million. Well, that's it on News Now. Thanks for watching. I am Fidelia Agoncha.